so here we are with the theremin almost packaged and that is what this video is all about. We're going to go through uh, the thoughts behind packaging the theremin and how I did the, uh, the cabinetry and the woodwork and all of the features that are built into the antennas. Uh, it's not complete. It's going to take one more video to do the actual tuning and loading and linearization of the machine if that's possible, by the way, there's no guarantees that uh, this will become a playable instrument. But uh, let's go through how to build it first. So, uh, where do we start? I kind of like the looks of the uh, classic RCA theremin. Uh, it kind of has a cool retro look. I like how the RCA theremin has a place to put your music. And uh, it's got the controls on the operator's side. Uh, it's an interesting looking box. It's got the cabinet doors on the back revealing the electronics within. So I took some of these ideas in the RCA and tried to uh, incorporate them in kind of a smaller package. As you can see the two antennas are fairly close together and uh, I wanted to uh, maintain you know a proper distance uh, similar to to this machine. Uh, when the RCA came out, it was a patented, uh, licensed machine and in, improvised on the original uh, theremin designs and made it producible. People dressed out their machines with some fancy lightning bolts and other shaped antennas that uh, look really cool but don't do a lot uh, music, musically uh, to improve uh, the original loop and monopole design which uh, gives the player the most flexibility and probably the best uh, shapes for uh, forming the notes. Uh, certainly a lightning bolt is going to be in unpredictable compared to a straight rod in the pitch antenna. So one uh, basic hint that these, an these are antennas is that the antennas on the theremin are orthogonal to each other. That is, there's a horizontally polarized antenna and a vertically polarized antenna. And the electromagnetic fields tend to not interfere with one another when the antennas are in the orthogonal position, such as this. So it's, if you had two vertical rods or two horizontal loops or two horizontal plates even, it would not be as effective as a vertical element and a horizontal element. We want to increase isolation between the antennas so the two antennas do not couple into each other causing one to affect the other's frequency. Remember we have two free-running oscillators. It's very easy for these two oscillators to couple to one another and influence each other. That's undesirable with a the theremin. To reduce coupling there are three major methods. One is simply spacing. Get the antennas spaced as far apart as possible. If we were able to grow your arms longer and separate the antennas, that would be an almost ideal situation. But practically, we can't do that. The other, area, uh, the other way to reduce coupling is to reduce the cross-sectional area that the two antennas see in one another. And finally, the third and probably most important is the principle of orthogonality. Orthogonality or perpendicularity in antennas means that the two antennas are basically at right angles to each other so that their electromagnetic fields do not interact. You can build up quite a bit of isolation uh, using this technique and it's uh, widely used in antennas. Next, uh, to prepare the chassis, I'll be going over every solder connection inside and making sure that uh, things don't look as bad as uh, when I'm in full, uh, full blast mode and uh, just tack soldering everything. So we have to go back and uh, I've got to really get the soldering uh, connections all checked out. I have removed all of the 
superfluous stuff left over from the school amplifier because I'm going to put a little dress panel on the back and this dress panel will uh, allow me to have uh, two controls on the back. I want to have the trimmer and I want to have the volume control on the back and the line jack on the front of the box. I'll put the on off switch and a jewel light. Also on the back, of course, we have the fuse and the power inlet. So um, you'll be able to see it's on from the front. The speaker will be on the front. The on-off switch will be on the front. But the volume control and the pitch adjust and the power and so on will be in the back with the operator. So while I'm waiting to move on and do the woodworking portion of this project, I did want to go back and revisit the section uh, where we did the line out. I had a kind of a interesting uh, cutoff jack system where when you plugged in the, uh, the line it uh, disconnected the speaker and you brought the output off the top of the, uh, the driver stage instead of the final. I got a little nervous about that circuit because we still had feedback hooked up and I was afraid that the disconnected speaker would mess with the feedback and it would feed right back into the same stage and we'd have kind of a race situation going on. So I relented and went back to the standard audio hookup that most guitar amplifiers use which is simply to attach a voltage divider right off the speaker and call that your line out and then when you want to turn off the speaker you use a switch. So. I have a load here of 47 ohms, so that keeps the, uh, the amplifier happy while the speaker is disconnected. That's important to have that there. Having a separate speaker switch and a line out, I think that makes for a cleaner setup. And of course we have the volume control and the pitch adjust. Take a look at the pitch trimmer. That works very well on the reference oscillator. You want to adjust your pitch with the reference oscillator, not the main oscillator because you're fooling around with a very high sensitivity part of the circuit. It's not where you want to do your adjustments. You want to do your adjustments on your very stable oscillator, your reference oscillator. It's time to start thinking about building a cabinet for the theremin. And, uh, of course, you can make the cabinet out of plywood. Um, there's some high-grade plywood that would be fine. Uh, pine boards. I've uh, chosen something kind of in the middle. Uh, it's not hardwood, like a beautiful walnut or some other nice uh, wood like they used in the old days. But uh, it's poplar. And poplar is kind of a a greenish wood that's a fast growing tree so it's less expensive than hardwoods but the grain is a step up from pine it's got quite a nice grain I don't like the green tinge to it so I will be using a stain on the uh, on the poplar um, the front of the unit and the rear of the unit uh, should be done with some thin poplar plywood type uh, material. I don't have time to uh, go out searching for that today so I'm just going to use ordinary masonite and you can see the masonite in the distance. Now that can be stained or that can be painted but the speaker baffle and the uh, the back of the unit that is uh, angled which is where you clip your music will be made with masonite. The bottom, the sides, and the top will all be poplar and that should give us nice strength. So it's kind of like a miniature version of kind of the uh, the RCA kind of design but it's much smaller. The width is uh, is quite uh, it's a little more the width than I needed and and that's good because we need to separate the pitch antenna from the volume control antenna as much as possible. So being wide is not a bad thing. Anyway, I wanted to show you the beginnings of this and the materials I'm going to use uh, for the cabinet. 
So this was not a, a very elegant design. I just bought a five foot piece of uh, poplar, nine inches wide. I had them slice me off a 16 inch piece for the base, two 12 inch pieces for the sides, and then uh, you know I, I had most of it done. The angles I cut with uh, a plywood blade on an ordinary skill saw. The theremin's case is coming right along now, and uh, of course, the woodwork was fun. That took a couple of days, but uh, you know, getting the speaker and its baffle, uh, getting the uh, the flip top on the back. I'm going to have some hinges here, and there'll be a flip top on the back, which will reveal the chassis tubes. You can get at everything from the top that way very easily. Then the speaker will be out front. I wanted to be able to remove the antennas, so I wasn't going to glue them in place or use some kind of uh, permanent attach method. And I just drilled through the the wood and put in these uh, brackets that uh, allow me to uh, loosen up and remove the the assembly. Now this assembly is kind of a uh, make do with what you got type thing. I've got a, uh, a pad, which I think will be the primary way of uh, doing the volume control. And I think a flat plate is a superior way than using these bars. But the whole thing's here. You can also adjust the uh, adjust in and out with this system, which is nice. Uh, the main antenna is uh, fairly easy to remove. It's just a uh, just a little hose clamp here. And I have affected a tuning mechanism that allows me to do the fine tuning on the pitch antenna, which is important to me as an experiment. So these are uh, it's a 20 centimeter rod that I'm using for the uh, for the antenna. So the way that I design stuff is not a disciplined type of situation. It's more of an inspirational exercise. I look around, think about things, try to use junk, and then uh, try to solve the problem with what I have on hand rather than designing the whole thing and then going out and buying everything. So to say that I planned this up front, no I didn't. But I just used the basic shape of the RCA and miniaturized it. So the next step is the staining. I need to get this cabinet stained and uh, the first thing I'm doing is looking for Mars dings and things as I've been building. I've been putting some marks in the wood and I'm just raising the grain using a little bit of water and uh, then I'll go away and then I'll start the sanding process. So it's, it's a good thing to do this uh, water trick. You can uh, save a lot of time by doing this, trying to get Mars out of the wood or cut marks. If you raise the grain first and let it dry and then sand it, you'll find that the sanding will go much easier. I'm beginning to close in on the final packaging of the theremin. Um, you can see that the chassis fits in and there will be a back lid with hinges and that, that comes up and uh, reveals uh, the inside so you can do adjustments. And it also doubles as a uh, way to hold uh, music. Um, I've added the uh, adjustment here on the side which is, allows the uh, pitch antenna to be adjusted. Now when you're at the top of the loading coil, that is a high impedance point. So this, uh, this adjustment will have quite a bit of an effect, um, even though it just looks like a, 
couple picoferrets that you're changing there, that can make quite a difference. Closing in on the front part of the theremin, we have the speaker baffle, which is removable. Uh, there will be a uh, basically a cloth grill that goes over this uh, decorative. Um, and over the cloth grill, there will be this uh, small bezel, which will go over these controls and capture the, the cloth. And uh, that finishes out the front. Uh, the on-off switch and the uh, jewel around the front. So the loading coils themselves are next uh, coming off the uh, pitch uh, binding post here. We'll go over to the loading coil and then up to the pitch antenna. So the loading coil will be in this area here. Uh, there will also be a loading coil for the volume uh, which will be in this area here. You can't see it very well, but down in there is where the uh, pitch loading coil is. This is a baffle that I've built out of a piece of masonite. Uh, it's meant to have a grill over the speaker as well as a grill cloth that's uh, captured in here. So this would have some kind of a pattern on it. Then over that, that would capture the cloth and that would dress out the, uh, the front of the, the theremin. We have the pitch antenna here, which is an aluminum rod that's tapered just slightly. And over here we have the, the volume uh, situation. It's just two parallel bars with an aluminum uh, kind of a hand pad arrangement on the side. So that's the front. Again, just a 6x9 uh, car speaker. More than enough uh, volume uh, for the room, that's for sure. So looking at the, uh, the side... This is the player side now. Um, I have a RCA-like shape. It's a little bit smaller, of course. And uh, I've got a, a flip top here. This is where your music would go, or your, your guide. And uh, under the flip top, we can see that uh, the electronics are exposed. Now we can see the, uh, the player's side of the unit. And I have uh, the fuse, a ground post, the AC inlet that goes through the IEC filter. This is a speaker on off switch. This is the line out. Here's your volume control and that volume control really needs to be a logarithmic pot and audio taper, not a linear pot because this thing has a lot of gain. And then finally over here we have the pitch zero control. Pitch zero. So by lifting this lid which will eventually have a, a latching system. Um, it exposes the, the internal. Uh, the chassis is nailed down by some self-tapping metal screws on the bottom, which is fairly common for putting chassis into uh, wooden cabinets. Um, I have no loading coils in here yet, just simple wires going up to the antennas. A uh, feature I'd like you to look at here, the adjustability that's built into the pitch antenna in the form of a disc capacitor which is a uh, compression style so as you turn the dial it gets closer to the pitch antenna adding this small amount of capacity to the antenna without loading coils is almost meaningless but once a loading coil is installed here this becomes a very high impedance point and you can get quite a bit of adjustability out of that so the coils will be mounted to the sides over here and I'm still working that out. That's for the next video. Okay, why the strange volume antenna? Uh, laziness mostly. I didn't want to try to form a loop here. Um, I figured more is better. This aluminum box uh, arrangement allows you to have a large capacitive area with your hand to do the volume control. So nothing, uh, nothing too radical here. It's uh, straightforward packaging. Bet you didn't know you could use it as a code practice oscillator, too. Hey, in the next video, we're going to get this thing tuned up.